Welcome to Grow Law From Podcast. I have an amazing guest with me here today. Omar Ochoa is a little different from everybody else who I have here. Omar, you're actually the very first client who I invent, invited on this podcast. You are, you've had quite an interesting journey. I know that you first became a CPA before becoming an attorney. And now you run your law firm from Southern Texas, Omar Ochoa Law Firm. And it is such a superstar model. It is very unusual to see one attorney who runs such a large ship as you do. Tell us about your st story. Tell us how you got here. Teach us. Yeah, I, I appreciate you are a hype man on my website and now on the podcast. So <laughs> I appreciate the enthusiasm that you bring to it. Uh, yeah, no, I, um, it's, it, it is a really interesting story, actually. So I was born and raised in South Texas uh, in a town called Edinburgh. It's in the McAllen-Brownsville area. Um, we ended up going to school at UT Austin. I was an accountant at General Motors. I uh, went back to UT for law school, and I ended up practicing law in Houston for many years. Uh, and while I was there, I was with a big um, litigation boutique called Sussman Godfrey. But I always wanted to come home to South Texas at some point in my career. Worked on some really big cases when I was with Sussman. Uh, got some really great results for our clients uh, at that law firm. Uh, but I got to a point where I felt like it was time for me to come home. Uh, and so I, I did. I finally came back to South Texas, started my law firm here. But as lawyers, what I have found is that we can really be anywhere because you know, we can travel, we can appear by Zoom, all these different kinds of things. So we are based in South Texas because this is where I love to be. This is where I am. But we have cases all over the state and we have cases across the country. Uh, so it's a really interesting practice and I'm, and I'm very proud of it. It's super interesting that you started your career as a CPA and before you're very modest. I know that you were class president, if I'm not mistaken, you were class president at your university. I was, yes. I was student body president at UT Austin. Mm -hmm. Student body president. Thank you. Yeah. And you became a CPA. What made you decide to go into law after spending time in accounting? Yeah. Yeah, great question. So I'm, I'm one of those people that has known I've wanted to be a lawyer since I was in first grade, right? That really annoying kid in elementary school that like, I'm going to be a lawyer when I grow up. That was me. Uh, and so I've always had this in mind. I've always wanted to do it. I worked for a lawyer um, the summer after my sophomore year of high school. And that was my first introduction to the day to day. Uh, and I learned so much in that job. I'm really grateful for the attorney who gave that opportunity to me. So I kind of always had it in my head, in my heart, right, that I wanted to practice law. Um, getting a CPA and getting business experience was a little bit of a deviation, but it was all in service of growing my skills uh, and being able to, um, to add something to myself that when I did start practicing law, uh, I would have this kind of hard uh, experience and this hard knowledge in uh, financial matters, which I thought was really important. Yeah, absolutely. I find that having finance background myself and my journey with accounting began 1994 when I was in high school. I had a brilliant teacher, Mr. Christie, who taught me accounting 101 and 102. We did everything by hand back then, no computers, ledgers, everything by hand. He was a brilliant teacher. And I still rely on the things that Mr. Christie, Christie taught me back in the mid-90s. Yeah. My, it's amazing, my, isn't it? Yeah. It is these things that these things that stick with you. I I totally agree. I could not imagine, well, first of all, I can't imagine running my business without the financial background, the accounting background that I had. I'm people do it, right? I'm sure. But you know, I'm a big spreadsheets guy. So I've got spreadsheets on top of spreadsheets, uh, analyzing all the different metrics, you know, uh, trying to boil down to what the issue is and then trying to resolve it. Um, and so this, this accounting background really helped me uh, with that analytical uh, view of things and the, and the business sense, right? Because on the one hand, as a business owner, uh, when, you're a, when you're a law firm, you got to worry about practicing law, servicing your clients, all those kinds of things. But you're also worried about growth of the business. Uh, and so it's something that uh, feeds both kind of loves in my life, accounting and the law. And so I, I really enjoy it. So I agree with this point. Come to think of it, everything that I learned through high school and through college, and I do have a degree in finance, there were a handful of practical courses 
that actually apply to managing a business. And the rest of it was truly a waste of time. My accounting <laughs> classes, my economics, and my intro to business were the only practical classes. And when I get to speak with at least a couple hundred attorneys every single year directly, just one-on-one, -on -one, not at conference, conference a lot more. Yeah. And I find it very interesting that so many would straight up tell you that I went into law because I didn't want to deal with numbers. But now I operate a business, a law right. firm. And I always picture it that if you don't like numbers, it's like you're driving a car or flying an airplane and you have two gauges. And everything else is turned off. And the only two gauges that you look at, number one is, do I have enough cash in the bank? Right. And number two is my revenue going up, stagnating, or going down. And <laughs> everything else doesn't matter. Yeah. <laughs> it's that bewildering a, to me. Yeah. That is a great analogy. You are so correct. You can look at those at two gauges, right, while you're flying a plane, and you're going to be in the air for a while. But you have no idea if the engine's going to blow, right? If your wheels are going to fall off, if you're going to lose cabin pressure. There are just so many things that you have to be tracking uh, as a business owner. Uh, uh, but, but I would agree with what you first said, which is you don't really need a ton of classes to get a good grounding in it. There really are just kind of a handful of very practical classes that somebody can take to become more familiar with this stuff. And then, of course, it takes practice uh, like anything else. But you're right, uh, an economics degree, an accounting degree, a finance degree, that's not really necessary. And if you're past that point, it's, it's not too late for you, right? Uh, take some financial statements courses, uh, take some managerial accounting courses that teach you how to track costs, how to frame costs in a way that you're looking at the important costs. Um, th those two classes, I think, would go a long way to somebody who's a business owner or wants to be a business owner. Uh, and to get some familiarity with the accounting needed for it. Yeah. And today, unlike 30 years ago, you can learn those things within hours, yeah. not not leaving your home or your office. You can learn these things on YouTube. Right? On YouTube, you even, absolutely. Yeah. You don't even need to sign up for a course or anything like that. Of course, there's some really good ones. And so if you take advantage, that, that's great. But you can you can learn all of this stuff from from your house. There's just so much information and content on there to to provide to you from your house, and then to everyone who operates a business. Hmm. I have two advisors. I think everyone should have an advisor. The president has a cabinet. <laughs> Every athlete has a number of coaches. Professional athlete. Heck, my high school kid has coaches. Right. And whenever I hear I am a law firm owner, I don't like numbers. I do not have an advisor. Yeah. And then we're looking at like where you are with your business. It's so clear why you are where you are, yeah. not where you want it to be. Right. Totally agree. And I think, you know, to, to frame it a little bit differently, I, I see it as kind of two buckets of people that you really need as a business owner, as a leader, as a manager. One is you need the, the professional colleagues, right, to be able to discuss your ideas with, learn from them how they're doing things, exchange ideas, because, you know, just because you do things well now, right, doesn't mean that you can't uh, start something new uh, or take on a new skill. But you're never really, really going to learn about that uh, unless you start sharing your information with other people and then the same will come back to you. So finding those kind of colleagues that can help sharpen you is really important. And that's kind of one bucket of relationships that I think it's, it's really important. The, the advisors, right, that you're talking about. But then the other bucket of people that's really important are mentors. These are people that are not necessarily the ones who are in your field. They're not necessarily going to be able to give you, um, you know, the ins and outs of what you should be doing different in your law firm. But they're people who have traits, personalities, um, achievements, that you're really drawn to because, uh, you know, as business owners, as lawyers, uh, even if we're successful, we need to continue to be inspired and we need to find that inspiration. And that's what really is going to push us to always keep going to the next level. And I find that it's with those mentors, um, people who just, you know, have achievements and success that you're looking for. They are great uh, sources to have to keep that inspiration going. Who mentors you? 
<laughs> Great question. So I've got a couple actually. Uh, I, I will say my number one mentor of all time is my dad. Uh, maybe that sounds a little cheesy, right, or whatever, but, uh, but my dad's an amazing person. He, was, uh, uh, he grew up as a migrant farm worker. Um, he went, went to college, right, the first in his family to do that. He's a pharmacist now, and he owns businesses uh, here in South Texas. He was the mayor of my hometown for 13 years. So a very accomplished guy, beloved in the community, um, and is just very, a very optimistic and passionate person. So I always kind of rely on him to give me that inspiration. Uh, aside from that, I've got, you know, business people uh, that I tap into. I still have contacts from General Motors, right, that I speak with. Uh, there are lawyers uh, in Houston and in D.C. that I made relationships with that, that I continue to, to stay in touch with. So I, uh, I, I've got plenty of sources of people that I tap into for my inspiration. It's amazing that you started the list with your father. <laughs> There is one more gentleman who has been on that po on this podcast. He is not a client, but he is an advisor to many, many, many law firm owners. His name is Louis Scott, and I had him on this podcast twice. He grew his small PI law firm. They're based out of Atlanta from $5 million to $40 million in the span of five and a half years. Incredibly successful guy. When I asked him, who is your mentor, he said, my dad. It's a great answer, <laughs> right? Answer. The, the, but both of us are very lucky to have that kind of examples in our lives. And then for me, I know that that's been a big reason for my success. Yeah, absolutely. If you were starting, and, and your, your firm now has been around, if I'm not mistaken, approximately six years, correct? Six years, that's right, yeah. Six years, six years. If you were starting from scratch now, brand new law firm, how would you scale it up to one, two, three million quicker than you did originally? <laughs> this is a great question because you're right. We, we, have, we have a very large staff now, but it took us a while to get to this point. You've got to build, right, layer on top of layer. Um, you know, one, one thing that I learned uh, maybe after a year or two, because as, as a CPA, right, the, um, the, that, that, the benefit of that is that I've got this financial knowledge and I'm able to kind of manage finances. But maybe one disadvantage of it was I was pretty conservative uh, with my financials for the first year, two years, um, you know, which, which is never really a bad thing. But at the same time, I wasn't investing enough in growth. Uh, I wasn't investing in technology. I wasn't investing in training my people. I wasn't investing in third party services uh, like Grow Law Firm uh, to help me grow what I was doing. And so I think you know, having that growth mentality is very important. Um, it's not enough to want to be successful. You got to know how to grow uh, and how to grow smartly. So I think, you know, maybe taking more risks early on or, or finding advisors, right, uh, who could have mentored me through the growing pains uh, might have helped me to scale a little bit faster. Um, but, you know, six years later, uh, I'm, I'm very happy with where we are and we, we're continuing to grow. Very impressive answer. What also very impresses me about you and your law firm is that you reached the scale that you did and you do not have a partner. Was this a conscious decision? Yes, it was actually. So I, um, you know, like I, said, I worked for a law firm for several years in Houston, worked with some really smart lawyers. But, uh, you know, I was, I was finding that I was the, really the only one working on some of these cases uh, in my trial teams, right? So I was the one that was the go-getter, right, going after it. Uh, and so it, it showed me that I had the ability to do this, right, to lead a law firm, to lead trial teams. Um, and so when I came home, it was not something that I was necessarily uh, looking to, to share with anybody. I had a vision for what it was I wanted my law firm to look like. Uh, and so being on my own, right, without having a partner uh, really helped me uh, or I guess gave me the freedom to shape my law firm to make the choices that I wanted to make uh, so that we could uh, grow. Uh, and, and I've really enjoyed that. I have other attorneys that work with me now, um, but as far as a partnership goes, it, it's just me here at the law firm. I think that that's great. And here's why. 
I've been in partnership now, partnerships, now two partnerships. The first partnership, my business partner was a brilliant guy. Built a very substantial business. We started off as two very close friends. And within years, we were not friends anymore. And we, we had very different visions for the business. And he ended up buying me out, which was best for both of us. My current business partner, who I've been partners with for almost six years now, we didn't start off our relationship as friends. And we're very focused on the business. And our skills are very complementary to each other. What I see most often with law firm partnerships, the people who become partners do not have complementary skill sets. They have same skill set. They bring the same thing to the game, thus they do not complement each other. And business usually stagnates. Yeah, yeah. So, that's a very good insight. You're, you're very right about that. It's like, uh, it's like any kind of relationship, any social relationship, right? Opposites attract. Uh, and so having somebody that fills gaps that you've got um, r really kind of goes a long way. And two people who are very alike are going to annoy each other <laughs> before too long. All right, so it's, it's bound to happen. The, the other thing that I'll say about this, right, is that by, uh, by, by being in charge of my law firm, that doesn't mean that I don't, you know, joint venture with other attorneys. Uh, and I, I find that's a very good way to stay flexible, right? It'd be one thing if I had a partnership and I always had to work with this person and it's just the two of us. But by being on my own, I have the flexibility to choose this lawyer to joint venture this specific case with. I can work with this law firm, right? If I want to on a different set of cases, I'm not bound to the same person. Omar, a few minutes ago, you mentioned something that really caught my attention. You said you had a vision. A few days ago, my 16 year old and I, I forced him to watch mini series on Netflix. We only watched the first one. We rarely watch TV and we rarely watch TV together because our interests are very different. He's happy to spend his days playing sports and being glued to his phone watching stupid videos on TikTok. <laughs> Last Sunday, a few days ago, we watched a miniseries named Arnold after Arnold Schwarzenegger. He spent a considerable part of part one talking about vision. He said that he accomplished everything because he had a clear vision of what life is going to be like when he becomes Mr. This, Mr. This, Mr. Yeah. This, ultimately numerous Mr. Universe title. You said for vision, and I think this is the second time, and I've been running this podcast for a little over a year. This is the second time that I hear someone use that word on this podcast. How did you develop your vision? And what was your vision when you were, even before you started out? Yeah, I, uh, I saw that same show on Netflix and I loved it. Right. I think you, you are absolutely right. This is a person that built his career based on a vision that he had when he was a teenager. And that is amazing. Uh, I, uh, you know, the, 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 there's two ways that, right, that, that I can try to explain this. On the one hand, uh, you know, in my, in, in my life, in my experience, you have to have a purpose, right? You can't just be doing something because you want to make money. You can't just be doing something because you want prestige. There's got to be more to that, right? You have to have a purpose that you're following. And if you've got that, that purpose is like gravity, right? You will always be grounded. You will be attracted to the things that will help you pursue that purpose. But if you don't have that kind of in mind, you're maybe sometimes floating. You're sometimes not able to decide what the best, uh, best path to go is because you don't have that grounding. So very important that that vision uh, equates to the same thing as that purpose, right? Is where is it that I want to be? Where do I see myself going or wanting to be in 5, 10, 15, 20 years? And don't be too afraid, right, to shoot for the moon. Uh, if you want to be the number one law firm in the country by revenue, right, in a 20-year time period, have that be your goal. And everything that you do, right, is in service of that goal. You might not get there, but you're going to find that you're going to be very successful either way. So I think, you know, having these very specific points uh, in time of where you want to be is important. Um, and being able to pursue those, right, with real purpose uh, is, is what's going to get you there. What was your purpose when you were starting out your law firm? Beyond just making money, beyond feeling successful. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's great. I, uh, 
you know, honestly, I, I've always just wanted to have an impact, right? And I, I've always wanted to have a large impact. I learned in, um, in law school especially, right, that the impact that a single case can have on the country and on the world. A decision that comes out of that case, um, a, a jury trial that results in punishment against a corporation that takes advantage of people, right? These are our cases have the potential to have a huge impact to improve people's lives. And so that really ha was and still is my purpose. How can I have the largest impact with the, the legal skills that I have? Um, when I was at my old law firm, you know, we did really big fat cases uh, that had, you know, global implications sometimes. Uh, here in this law firm, we still have those cases, but we also have a lot of higher volume cases that deal with individuals and individual issues. Um, but we continue to try to have the biggest impact that we can, because ultimately, you know, in my opinion, at least, that's what lawyers are for, uh, is to be able to help people and be able to move us forward. Yeah, that's very interesting. I want to connect a couple of dots and they are I think a lot of people would so get on board with having a vision of thinking about, I am going to aim for the moon, whatever that may be, the largest firm by revenue right. in anything else. But I think a lot of people would probably stumble on the next step. And that is, all right, I got the vision. I have the purpose. But I don't think it's realistic. And this is where mentors and advisors come in. And this is where, and, and I can give you our example, my partners and I. So we're working on becoming a $100 million marketing company. We're nowhere near that. We have many, many years to go, and we know it, and we work hard every day. I've been here for almost six years. January 3rd is going to be six years, so about two months from now. The most recently hired advisor who we have has sold his marketing company for nearly $100 million. He's an expensive advisor. <laughs> but what he gives us is we had the vision, we have the purpose, we know why we do it. We had a somewhat murky how. So my partner found this guy who sold his marketing company a little over three years ago, and we know his marketing company very well. They're also based here in Chicago. And reached out, connected. Would you mentor us? And the guy said, sure. In fact, I'm working on a new project for other marketing company owners. So you'd be a perfect fit. Expensive? Yes. Ultimately, 100% free. Yeah. So if you're I, watching I this, agree. listening I, to this. Yeah, I completely agree with that, right? Being able to put together the strategy and the action with the vision and the purpose is the challenge, right? And that's how you get from where you are to where you want to be, is being able to find those strategies and, and action points. Uh, the, uh, you know, the advisors and the mentors is really important uh, what I, and for all the reasons that we've already talked about. What I would add to that is you have to be a consumer of knowledge um, for how other people have been successful. Right. I love reading biographies, right? For example, the Elon Musk biography, Albert Einstein, Napoleon, uh, Lyndon Johnson. I mean, you you read these stories about people who achieve these extraordinary things, and you start to see a pattern, right? Which is nobody's an overnight success. Absolutely nobody. Everybody had helped to get there, right? Everybody failed, uh, and not only small, but everybody failed big, right? At some point in their career, but uh, but they all shared the same trait, right? These these biographies that I read about um, uh, wonderful people. Uh, and that's they never let go of their dream, right? They kept going for it, even if they did fail, uh, and even if they didn't know exactly how to get there. Uh, so I think, you know, consuming this knowledge about how other people are successful uh, is really important uh, to, to put it all together. Because I think, like uh, we've been saying, you know, marrying that action with, the, with your uh, dream, your vision, your purpose, right? That, that's how we get there. Very interesting. I read a few of those biographies. I found that Musk's biography, starting with him asking the question, it just stuck in my head. Do you think I'm insane? He was <laughs> asking that question of the person who ultimately wrote his biography. I think that that's a brilliant biography. And Abraham Lincoln's biography. If there was one man 
one great man who has failed a ton. You don't need to look any further than Abraham Lincoln, who failed and failed and failed and failed and ultimately became immortal. Yeah, <laughs> it's true. Yeah, totally agree, right? And we see tons of examples of that. Uh, I mean, you know, George W. Bush, for example, right, waited until he was 40 years old to start blossoming in his career and he becomes president of the United States. Uh, uh, Thomas Edison, right, failed repeatedly and he failed by design so that he can come up with inventions that change people's lives. Uh, so yeah, to totally agree. That's something that happens all the time. There's a great advice in what you just said for parents. And that is, I listened to something, a podcast with the lady whose name I currently do not remember. She is the founder of Spanx, Sp Sp something, ladies wear. First oh. female billionaire. Um, Spanx. Spanx. Yeah. She said her father taught her and her brother to fail at something every day. Every evening at the dinner table, he would ask them separately, what did you fail at today? He made failure part of their daily practice, and that's how they grew and became, I don't know the story of her brother, but that's how she became what she became. She was not afraid to fail because failure is what she did every single day since her childhood. No big deal. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's really good. I never really thought about it that way, but you're, but you're right. We have to normalize failure. Uh, of course, you never want to be so catastrophic that it alters your life or somebody else's life in a negative way, right? But we have to not be so afraid to take risks. Um, you know, re realizing that that's how you grow. Um, you know, I'll, I'll say with, with my own staff, uh, you know, I, I give them lots of opportunities to grow their skills. Uh, I think, you know, I'm not a micromanager by any means. Uh, I'm not directing them exactly how to do their jobs. I tell them what the goal is. And I hire people who are smart enough to figure out how to get there. Um, but everybody fails, right? And even they make mistakes along the way. It's all about coaching them. Uh, and getting them to improve on their skills. But if you don't give them that opportunity to fail, they'll never learn something different. Don't agree with you more. My, our other mentor has taught me how to decide whether a risk is worth it. He said, you're going to fail a lot. And this is a guy who built a nearly billion dollar company. And he said, and he failed a lot in the process. He said, you're going to fail a lot. When deciding whether you're going to take the risk or not, just ask yourself, if this does not go your way, will it multiply all of your other efforts by zero? Meaning, will it pulverize everything else you've done? Yeah. If it won't, you're probably going to be okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. That's a great barometer. Yeah, I'll try to use that in my daily life. Um, <laughs> but that's a really good way to put it. Because we very rarely make such risky decisions that can actually multiply everything by zero. It's incredibly rare that you put everything on black or everything on red. Almost never in business, right? You always take calculated or somewhat calculated risk. You never know exactly how the outcome is going to be. So an example with our other mentor, incredibly expensive guy who built a company, marketing company, and sold for nearly $100 million. His plan is not going to be perfect for us because... You can't reverse engineer and repeat the exact same steps. That's right. Different time, different market, because he didn't work with law for so many different things. And that's okay. But everything that he is teaching us, we're implementing not everything, but like 70, 80% of what he is teaching us. And we know that if he was mistaken, if we're mistaken, none of it is going to multiply everything that we've done before by zero. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. That's a great way to look at things because you're because you're right. Very, very, it's very hard to do something that's going to, uh, you know, be a cataclysmic effect on your career. Um, you know, so you you really shouldn't be so scared that oh, if I if I fail at this one task, if I fail at this one business venture, that's it for me. More than likely, that's not the case. I think the biggest fear is not of failure, but the biggest fear is of looking bad. <laughs> yes, I think that's I think there's some truth to that. Yeah, for sure. Um, which is why, you know, your your comment or I guess the story earlier, you know, normalizing failure is really important. 
Uh, and doing that within a family, right, helps the kids to grow. Doing that within a business helps all of the employees, right, to grow. Uh, to not judge somebody because of a single failure. Uh, I think that's actually really important and very insightful of you, right? That uh, the what, what people are really looking to do is to is to maintain uh, their prestige factors or integrity, right, to other people. When ultimately, right, it's the body of work that should judge that, and not just any single incident. Yeah. Probably to wrap this up, there is a change that's coming toward legal industry, and it's already taken place in some in one state, and that is now non-lawyers can own law firms. I think there's probably going to be a sea of change in the next five, seven, ten years as private equity firms are going to enter into the arena and make things a bit more difficult for smaller law firms. Would you ever, and you're growing your firm organically and quickly, but would you ever consider buying another law firm to grow inorganically, to double in size just through acquisition? And if no, why not? Right. The answer to that is yes, right? I would definitely mm -hmm. do that. I think, you know, like I said, ha having this business background makes ideas like that comfortable for me. Um, there, you know, so, so non-lawyers owning firms is a big, is a big deal and it's a big thing that's coming up. Uh, it allows potentially, you know, if this were to be more widespread access to capital markets, uh, it changes the way leadership mm, is done at law firms. There's a lot of considerations about legal ethics, um, that come into play with all of this. Right. But I think the future is going to look something more like that, more like public ownership of law firms, as opposed to private ownership, um, by just, by just lawyers. Uh, and, and if that happens, I think there's a lot of growth potential uh, for firms. So I, I don't think people should be scared necessarily of changes like this, uh, because ultimately what it's going to do, hopefully, uh, is to push law firms to be able to give better service to people. There's a lot of people with legal needs out there on all levels. Uh, and all of these solo law firms, right, trying to go after different clients, it doesn't always necessarily, um, you know, better serve people. Uh, so I think having more resources, having more people involved uh, is going to be a good thing for legal services eventually. But people shouldn't be scared of change and innovation. Yeah. One thing that I think people should be scared of, when I think about private equities entering into any new market, there are some acquisition targets. There are some companies that are incredibly lucrative for them to buy. And then there are some companies that are incredibly not lucrative for them to buy. So when you think about the change that's coming, and this may be five years away, seven years away, but that change should be coming as it came to so many other service businesses, service industries. I have friends who sold their businesses to other service, oh, to, to other private equity firms. And what they did find is that with private equities leading them now, they do deliver better services, more consistent. Everything is better organized. The reason they were able to sell was because they were already fairly well organized. Private equities asked them a ton of questions before deciding whether they should buy them or not. So if I was running a very small solo or semi-solo where there are a couple of partners and they call them semi-solo because there are two partners but in reality they're not partners they're just sharing expense of the office and maybe a paralegal but if you're running a very small very small law firm and it's disorganized you may be in danger in those five seven ten years because those private equities they will buy your competitors and they will make it that much harder for you to get business yeah, no, completely agree. I'll I'll uh, I'll tell you another. So another Netflix series that I've been watching is Life, uh, mm -hmm. right about life on the planet and the and the history of it. And there's a truism that comes out of that, right? Which is the the species that's most likely to survive are the ones who are best suited to the conditions and the environment that they live in, right? So if you don't have the skill sets, if you don't have the competitive advantage to be able to survive your current conditions. You're very, you're not likely, right, to be able to to go to continue on. Uh, so it's important to understand what the condition and environment is around you, and to adapt. Uh, because if you don't adapt, right, you're going to be stuck outside of that model, and everybody else is going to move forward without you. Because that's because that's what business and that's what life does. It just it continues to move forward. Yeah. So 
do not bury your head in the sand thinking that that change is not going to come to your state i think that that change will snowball it started in colorado if i'm not mistaken or maybe your neighboring arizona one of those two states the other one is considering and they will just start changing state by state and yeah. this will happen private equities are hungry for good businesses to buy and by the way here's another great piece of information if you decide to sell your law firm you do not have to sell it entirely my friends who sold to private equity funds they sold 80 percent of their business but the other 20 percent was reinvested into a much larger entity that is the pe company so you may actually become wealthy off of that but you have those five seven ten years to build up something that's truly desirable so that you can thrive in that environment yeah yeah i love it i love it this is this is what we're talking about right this is that vision right if you see this coming right then you need to start getting ready for it now to take opportunity yeah so true omar it's been such a pleasure to have you here thank you so much for sharing all the insights yeah no it was fun it was fun chatting uh hopefully we can do this again sometime would love to mm -hmm.